Hello InfoPerson, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty interesting discovery of yet another unusual fast radio burst, also known as FRP, coming from an extremely well-known galaxy. The galaxy you see right here, known as M81 or Messier 81, also known as the Bode's Galaxy. And because of the unusual discovery parameters of this fast radio burst, and also because of its repetitive nature, this is probably one of the more interesting discoveries of the last few months. But just a quick reminder, so fast radio bursts are still a bit of a mystery. A lot of scientists today believe that they might be produced by magnetars, or at least one of them has been produced by magnetar, the one in the Milky Way galaxy, but a lot of them still don't really make any sense, especially the repetitive ones. There's also another recent video you might want to check out that explores this idea a little bit further through a study by NASA and by Hubble telescope that identified several um, locations of various fast radio bursts in distant galaxies. This video should be popping up somewhere right there sometime in the future. Anyway, so these radio bursts are extremely fast, there's a lot of them all over the night skies, more and more of them have been discovered pretty much coming from every major direction in outer space, with current predictions standing at about 10,000 per year, and we still have no true idea of what's causing these bursts or if they're actually from the same phenomena or from completely different phenomena. But here's what we know about the recent detection of the FRB with the name you see right here that was recently analyzed and reanalyzed by several different studies. And first of all, because it's a repeated FRB, the scientists were able to track it relatively accurately to its original location and also estimate the approximate distance of the signal. They discovered that it's coming from a very well-known galaxy. The galaxy that's already known for basically being one of the most beautiful Milky Way-like galaxies in the vicinity, with a relatively massive black hole in the center that's about 70 million masses of the Sun, an active galactic center that produces a lot of energy, but surprisingly only a single supernova detected ever. So it's not a very active galaxy, but it is a very interesting galaxy anyway. But at the same time, this galaxy also has two partners that are to some extent influencing its future. You can actually sort of see them in a the distance. This galaxy right here known as M82 and this one here known as NGC 3077. Now, because of the interaction between these galaxies, a lot of gas has been stripped from all of them and some of this gas is falling back into the other two galaxies, resulting in a tremendously large formation of new stars, what's known as a starburst. And a lot of interesting activity is also obviously happening in the M81 galaxy, that's the larger member here, with this infrared image showing us a lot of activity and a lot of various gas and star formation happening in the spiral arms of this galaxy, with the most activity obviously being in the center. And just to give you a contrast, this is the optical image or optical light image of this galaxy as well. Now because this galaxy is so close to us, relatively speaking, only 11.7 million light years away from us, or roughly around 4 times as far as the Andromeda galaxy, this is one of the most well studied galaxies to date. And also one of the most well known because you can easily see this with simple binoculars or with a relatively simple telescope. And so when the FRB was detected coming from this region, it was very surprising because this makes this the second closest FRB ever and the closest extragalactic FRB, making this about 40 times closer to us than some of the previous FRBs coming from other galaxies. And by the way, if you were to look around here, you would even see our own galaxy, the Milky Way, somewhere right there in a the distance. We can even jump to it just to see how relatively close this is to us. But when they analyzed exactly where the signal came from, when they actually tried to identify the potential location of the signal, something about it was not adding up. The signal was pointing at this. It was pointing at a global cluster. And so this would be the first confirmed FRB coming from inside a typical global cluster. But there's a bit of a problem with this, mostly because of what we know about global clusters. First of all, when it comes to FRBs, once again, the assumption right now is that they're produced by magnetars, or at least we know they can be produced by magnetars. This is of course because of the previous detection, once again in one of the previous videos. Now to date we've only found 24 confirmed magnetars. They are pretty rare objects. Generally speaking, it's basically a star, usually a very massive and very powerful star, that goes supernova and stays as a magnetar for possibly a few hundred years, possibly a few thousand years, but not very long. After this time it just becomes a normal neutron star, and remains more or less invisible to us because it doesn't produce a lot of emissions anymore. But when it comes to global clusters, such as this open one right here that doesn't have a lot of stars, or this one right here that has a lot more stars, 
One thing we know for sure is that global clusters are generally extremely old, often as old as the galaxy, usually over 13 billion years old. And a lot of stars here have been here for an extremely long time. Many of them are smaller than our sun, there are not a lot of really massive stars left, and so we don't really expect there to be any magnetars simply because of the way we think magnetars are created. It definitely has neutron stars, it also definitely has pulsars. As a matter of fact, here's a graph showing us 230 different pulsars in 36 known global clusters relatively close to us. But pulsars and neutron stars have very different properties from a typical magnetar. They do not possess these extremely powerful magnetic fields that are used to explain how FRBs are formed. And so because of this, something doesn't add up. If this FRB indeed came from this particular global cluster, and if it was produced by a magnetar, this would be an extremely rare detection. As a matter of fact, so unlikely that the scientists don't actually think it's possible. However, if this FRB came from something else that's not magnetar, we've just confirmed once again that something else can create these particular phenomena, and we still have a lot to learn about them. Right now, this is the preferred explanation that a lot of scientists behind this study also have as well. At the same time, another possible explanation is that, well, maybe magnetars can actually form or reform from a neutron star once it experiences some sort of a cataclysmic event, maybe a collision, or maybe some sort of a sudden increase in mass from something else next to it, or maybe because of the interaction or collision with some other object. Maybe this is from a collision between two white dwarfs forming a magnetar at the end. And so one potential explanation here is that this could be a discovery that implies magnetars can actually form in different ways. Or basically that magnetars are way, way, way more numerous and way more likely to exist out there than we currently imagine. Even though we only discovered 24 of them, all of these FRBs we're detecting only imply that magnetars are all over the place. And if every one of them is responsible for these signals we're detecting, this technically makes this one of the most prominent objects in the universe, something that currently would be very difficult to explain. Especially because we currently think that magnetars can only really form from very specific supernova. One of the recent discoveries coming out of modern telescopes, including this one right here known as NICER, located on the International Space Station, is the very recent discovery of this magnetar right here that's the youngest magnetar ever found. And this magnetar is right in the middle of a supernova remnant that happened a few hundred years ago. And because of this, it's always been believed that magnetars can only be produced by these very powerful supernova from extremely massive stars, but only stay as magnetars temporarily. As the supernova disperses and as the neutron star becomes older, it loses its power and just turns into something else. Which is also, of course, why we don't see a lot of these objects in the galaxy. And so there's definitely a discrepancy between what we see in terms of fast radio bursts and what we detect in terms of actual magnetars in the Milky Way. Although one explanation here is, of course, well, maybe they could be everywhere, but because they're spinning in such a way that their actual emissions are not hitting our planet, we're just not seeing them. Kind of similar to what we think pulsars are doing. Or maybe we just don't really understand how the mechanism producing these FRBs works and how the emissions are created. But because there are so many of them in every galaxy, we're seeing the ones coming from distant galaxies all the time. Either way, this makes it a very interesting phenomenon and a very interesting mystery that I've personally been following quite religiously trying to figure out what exactly is happening here by reading various studies. But unfortunately, as of today, we're still kind of far from being able to explain what's happening here. We really only have three very specific observations helping us understand what possibly creates them, but doesn't give us the exact answer. So we know that at least one FRB was created by the magnetar in the Milky Way galaxy, something that was officially reported on a few months ago. We also know that when Hubble telescope was able to track down some of the other FRBs, it's found that they came from various spiral galaxies and specifically from the region near the arms of those galaxies. Regions similar to where we are right now as well, so basically where the sun is. So not really the regions where you would expect to find a lot of magnetars either. Specifically regions very close to those spiral arms, similar to where our sun is. And because of this, things like neutron star collisions or some of the large ancient stars were out of the question, mostly because we don't usually find these types of events in these regions. And lastly, now we have this new discovery coming from a global cluster where there are a lot of ancient stars, but none of them are really massive. There are also some pulsars and some really, really old objects that have been there for billions of years. 
but very likely no magnetars. Which once again only implies one thing, they seem to be produced by very different events or by something entirely different we don't really understand just yet. With one explanation suggesting that maybe magnetars are way 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 more common than we thought and can also be produced by various means we've never imagined before. So either way though, these discoveries create an incredible opportunity for a lot of future studies and a lot of really exciting discoveries that right now are very difficult to imagine. And I'm really looking forward to a lot of these discoveries. In the last few years studying these objects have been very fascinating to a lot of scientists around the world and it's been very fun following their discoveries and reading their papers. So I'm definitely looking forward to learning more about this and sharing this with you in some of the future videos. But I guess until then we don't really know much else. Cool discovery, very unusual mystery, something to look forward to in the next few months as more and more studies and more and more discoveries are made. Anyway, on that note, check out some of the papers I mentioned in the video in the description below and also the original detection or the original optical observation of this galaxy that allowed us to find and track all of this in the link in the description below as well. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.